Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? I'll try not to yell tonight. <laughs> I got a note on Sunday. I hope the person's not here. <laughs> I got a note on Sunday that said, does your pastor always yell? And does he talk, what, it said, he talks so fast I can't download the information fast enough or something like that. So I'll slow down a little bit tonight. But um, what? I can yell? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, no, um, they're not. They're a beautiful person, I'm sure. We love them and they're lovely. Uh, just, it was a funny note. I got a kick out of it. Anyway, hey, so um, if you are new to this, we're going just uh, verse by verse through Genesis. Tonight we're in Genesis chapter 25 and 26. There's a lot of verses tonight, a lot of names tonight. So give me some grace when I permit when I uh, mispronounce most of them. Um, there's going to be some familiar, some very familiar stories tonight, and there's going to be some unfamiliar stories tonight. Um, but how did we leave off last week with uh, chapter 24? What was the last thing that happened? Somebody got married. Yeah, Isaac and Rebecca get married. Um, and, and something that I want to point out from last week, because we're kind of going to see it revisited again this week. Remember um, when God told Abraham, he said, you know, pro, uh, Abraham t uh, talked to his servant and said, hey, promise me that you'll go get a wife for my son. Uh, I want you to leave this country, go back to where I'm from, find a wife for him there, but make sure you don't take him with you. Remember, he said, make sure Isaac stays in the land. Uh, and so he, went, the servant goes and finds the wife and brings Rebecca back to him, and they get married. Because we're going to see that again uh, in chapter 26, I believe. It might be 25 tonight, where God instructs Isaac not to leave the land. So there's something important about Isaac not leaving uh, the land that God had promised him and his descendants, and we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, so we know Isaac and Rebecca are now married. Uh, Abraham is uh, getting up there in age. Uh, Sarah had died uh, and was buried. Remember, Abraham bought that plot of land. Remember, he just wanted to buy a cave, but then he ends up buying a field, this whole plot of land uh, where Sarah is buried. And we're going to find that this is where a lot of the family is going to be buried as we move on. Um, so that's kind of where we left off last week. Let's start in Genesis 25, and we're going to start real hot and heavy with some names that I can't pronounce. Uh, Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 1, it says, Abraham had taken another wife. How many of you guys know Abraham gets married after Sarah dies? Only a couple of you. So he gets married again. So Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah. Now, how many of you guys knew that Abraham was married to somebody named Keturah? Not many. Okay, so it's brand new for most of us tonight, right? She bore him, and this is where it's going to get fun. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Med Medin, Midian, Ishbak, Shua, Jokshan, was the father of Sheba and Dadan. The descendants of Dadan were the Asherites, the Lechusites, and the Lemites. The son of Midian, the sons of Midian were Ephra, Epher, Hanuk, hey, hey, Abe. <laughs> I told you guys I'd struggle. Yeah, these guys, all these were descendants of Keturah. So, how many, how many sons was that? Six? So, remember Abraham and Sarah were having a hard time having a son. So, we see, and it, we see that it wasn't Abraham's problem, it was Sarah's problem, obviously. He did not have problem uh, creating offspring. Um, and, and that was alluded to earlier in Scripture. It says, Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Now what in the world does, does it mean by he gave gifts to his sons and his concubines? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? What do you what do you what are they talking about when they say concubines? Girlfriends. Well, I mean, in scripture, all we really see is we see it's Hagar, 
Sarah, and now Keturah. So some scholars are saying that when it says concubines, um, it's talking about Hagar and Keturah uh, because Sarah was looked at differently because she was part of the blessing. Does this make sense? No? Because later on, you're going to see later on in Scripture, even though it says he took another wife, Keturah, she's going to be listed as a concubine and said as a concubine rather than a wife. And so that's why a lot of scholars say they're, they're trying to hold Sarah up to a higher standard because we're going to read all about Sarah later on and in the New Testament and about her faith. And so I think that a lot of scholars are in the thought that when he says the concubines, he's talking about Hagar and Keturah. Does that make sense to those of you that have been following along? Anyway, um, but while he was still living there, okay, I already read that. Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last breath and died at a good age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zoar, the Hittite. Remember, this is the field that he bought two uh, chapters ago. Um, the field Abraham, oh, it says, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. Then Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son, I'm sorry, after Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived in, in a town I can't pronounce. Thank you, guys. So we see, obviously, Abraham... Uh, is buried with who? And now, while he remarries and has six more sons, it says that he gave, what does it say? It says that he gave uh, good gifts to his sons, um, but he sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. And so Abraham is remembering that God said there's something special about your son Isaac. Remember, uh, God had promised Abraham you'd have a son, and they, him and Sarah weren't able to have a son. So he takes Hagar, a concubine, has a son with him, named, or with her named Ishmael. And God says, that's great that you had Ishmael, whatever, but your son is going to come from Sarah. And when they have Isaac, he says, this is the one that's going to have uh, the descendants that I've been talking about, the blessing that I've been giving you. And remember, Abraham goes, well, are you going to bless Ishmael too? And God says, yes, I'll bless Ishmael, but Isaac is the one that's going to receive the real inheritance. Okay, remember that story? And now we see, so we see Ishmael, we see Isaac, we see these six other sons, but all the other sons are sent away. Isaac is still in the land that God promised them. We all on the same page? This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Ishmael, whom Sarah's slave Hagar, the Egyptian, bore to Abraham. More names. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael listed in the order of their birth. Anybody want to pronounce that first one? Neb Nebioth, Nebi, uh, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Adbel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Mesa, <laughs> Massa, Hadad, Tama, Jetar, Nafish. <laughs> Why did they come up with these names? And Kedme, uh, Ked, Kedma. I can't bear, I can barely read English, let, let alone read these names. Uh, these were the sons of Ishmael, and these were the names of the 12 tribal rulers according to their settlements and camps. Ishmael lived 137 years. He breathed his last breath and died, and he was gathered to his people. His descendants settled in the area from Havel to Shore, uh, near the eastern border of Egypt, as you go towards Asher. They, and they lived in hostility towards all the tribes related to them. And so now we're getting the genealogy of Ishmael. We see that he was blessed with many sons. 
right? He was blessed with many lands. He was blessed with all of, all of these sons. He was blessed by living 137 years. He was blessed that he, all the people gathered around him as he breathes his last breath. Uh, and so this description of Ishmael, Ishmael is a description of somebody that was definitely blessed, right? In those days, especially having sons was considered a blessing. And so we see that God lived up to what he said he was going to do when he talked to Abraham and said, yes, I will bless Ishmael. I will bless him, uh, and so we see that he's blessed, but we see that he's not going to receive uh, that Abra Abraham covenant, that, that covenant of God uh, that Isaac's going to get. Um, and so kind of 25 gives us all of this stuff, uh, and then we keep reading, and now we're going to get into more of a familiar story. It says, this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel the Aramin uh, from Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Does this sound familiar? Okay, we're going to read some things that are going to sound like a very familiar story with Abraham and Sarah, but we're going to see a lot of similarities between uh, um, Isaac and Rachel here. So it says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless, just like Sarah and Abraham. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two people within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So God's giving her this prophetic word that the older will serve the younger, that there's two nations that will be separated within your womb. Uh, and it's interesting that God says the older will serve the younger because in those days, the, the younger always served the older. The older had the birthright. The older was the spiritual leader of the family. The older was the, the more prominent usually. And so this is kind of countercultural what God is telling uh, Rebecca, as she's pregnant with twins, uh, and when he says the, the older will serve the younger. And so this is going to be a little bit backwards, but do you see another similarity between the last generation? We see Isaac was the second born. Ishmael was the first born, but Isaac was the one with the blessing. And we're going to see here the younger will have the blessing more than the older. So God decides to do things a little bit backwards that were culturally acceptable at that time. A lot of similarities. Uh, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out, and he was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Anybody know what Esau means? Yeah. It's a description of who he, how would you like to be named hairy or in red? Jim, how would you like to be named Harry? <laughs> um, that was quick, right? That was a dad joke. I'm 41 now. I got all sorts of now. Okay. Um, so they named him, uh, lost my spot. They named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Anybody know what Jacob means? Supplanter deceiver, right? It's uh, kind of, uh, to be honest with you, that name is not a very endearing name. Like it's a name of being like, hey, you're, you're a con man. You're, like it wasn't a name that you would really want, so, but they're naming him after what he's doing. So one guy's named Harry Red Guy, the other guy's named Sir Planter, uh, uh, you know, because he's hanging on to his brother's heel. Um, Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Interesting. So we have two boys, and they're very different. One likes to go out and hunt. And he's hairy and red, and the other guy's content to stay around the house. 
One, the father loves the, the manly man of them, and, and the mother loves the other one. And it, it's kind of an interesting family dynamic here. I wonder if they didn't get along very well because they were such opposites. How many of you guys have kids, and they're very different from one another? I do. I got three of them, and they're all different, right? And we see a big difference between, between the two. But it's interesting. I love all my kids, but it says... It says, Isaac loved Esau, and his mother loved Jacob. It's kind of interesting. They were probably showing a little bit of favoritism there. You guys don't do that with your kids, right? Never. Absolutely. So, <laughs> with your kids sitting next to you, that's terrible. Uh, once Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick. Let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why they called him Edom. Does anybody know what Edom means? Yeah, red stew. Like, I just, the Bible's crazy because the names that they have, like, could you imagine being named after, like, I mean, we give people nicknames like that, right? Uh, my best friend, I'll tell you this, my best friend growing up, um, his name like, even teachers called him this. His nickname was Lucky. And to this day, we call him Lucky. His, everybody calls him Lucky. I remember being in school, teachers called him Lucky. Everybody called him Lucky. And he got that nickname because when he was a little kid playing baseball, everybody said he looked like the guy on the cereal box, Lucky Charms, the little leprechaun. <laughs> and so it stuck with him. He's 40 years old, and people still call him Lucky today. It's crazy. I remember we had friends in high school, and I was really good friends with him, and every once in a while I'd joke around, his real name's Nathaniel. And one time I was like, Nathaniel, I was just being silly, and somebody's like, is that really his name? Like, people that knew him for years didn't even know his real name, just because, and it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, God, we, we've seen earlier that God changes people's names when God changes something about them. We saw Abram was changed to Abraham, or, you know, Sarah, Sarah, we see, uh, Peter's, you know, name. We see all these names being changed through Scripture because they're meaningful to God. Uh, and I just want to share that with you. In Scripture, a lot of times when you read somebody's name, look it up and see what it means. And a lot of times the name has to do with their character or what they were doing in Scripture at the time. It's, it's kind of crazy um, how God does it. Anybody got a good nickname? Do you know what my nickname was growing up? Bubba. My brother called me Bubba because I was chunky. <laughs> okay. Any good nicknames in the house? No good nicknames? What do they call you? <laughs> Tex. Why? Oh. Got it. Cowboy singer Tex Ritter. John Ritter, Tex Ritter. All right, I'm calling you Tex from now on. <laughs> Any other good nicknames? Nobody's got good nicknames in here, or are you just too embarrassed to tell us what they call you? Baby cake? Baby cake. I'm not going to call you that. <laughs> Maybe I will. Lindsay might. Anyway, we'll go. Okay. So, one... <laughs> Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, I already read that. Okay, he wanted, he was famished. And Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. When Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, he ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. That easy. What, who in here knows what all entails in a birthright? So uh, the older brother comes in, he's like, I'm so hungry, give me some stew. And he's like, oh, if you're that hungry, give me your birthright and I'll give you some stew. And he does it. So you would think a birthright can't be that important, right? So what is a birthright? Double portion. Double portion, blessing, spiritual leader of the household, all sorts of really good stuff. And Isaac is super wealthy. Remember how wealthy Abraham was? 
Isaac is wealthy as well. We're going to see that in here in a little bit too. So he's giving up a double portion of the inheritance and the right to be the leader of the family and the household for a bowl of stew and some bread. Yeah, everything moving forward. I mean, it's the spiritual leader of like moving forward. Like, it's crazy. And he gives it up. Now, it's interesting that he says, Esau says, what good is the birthright to me? Um, some, some translators or, or some scholars say that he wasn't just saying that it's not that meaningful. He's like, but what am I really going to do with it? Like, I, I'm going to have enough anyway. It's not that big of a deal to me. And that's why it says, and so he despised his birthright. He didn't really care. We're going to see later on that he didn't really care that much about his family either because he does some things to disappoint mom and dad. Not that we've ever done anything to disappoint our parents um, in this place. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to die anyway. What what good is it? Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it was just kind of, and that's why it says he despised it. Uh-oh, Steve's got a mic. I've often read this, and I just can't figure it out. You know, Esau, okay, he's this big hunter. He's favored by Isaac. You know, he's sort of, like you said, probably a man's man, and Jacob just hangs around the thing. I don't, you know, Esau, not only did he despise it, he was stupid. Let's face it, all he had to do is say, you either give me that stew or I'll make it myself and I'll give you the world's worst beating when I'm done. <laughs> you know, but, but he was so flippant with it. He, it's like you said, it's like you, you get a double portion. You get all this respect. You're the leader of the family and he just despised that. Yeah. It's, but, but I've never understood why he just didn't turn around and say, you give me that stew or else you're going to get your butt kicked after this. Did you have a brother? Older brother, much older. S sounds like it, yeah. And then <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, it, it's, it is interesting. Um, and, and one of the things too is before these guys are even born, before they make these decisions, before they do all these things, they are... Um, God already said, hey, the younger is going to serve the older. And, you know, it's, it goes back to that thought, is, is it God's foreknowledge knowing that all this is going to happen, or did God choose him before he was born? Is it, is it, it was just, God just understood what was going to happen. It, it, it's crazy, yeah. And we can get into foreknowledge, election, and predestination tonight, but we won't. That'll be a different night. Um, so he gives up this birthright, this double portion, spiritual leader of the family, head of the household, uh, to his brother for some stew and, and, uh, and some bread. Verse uh, chapter 26. Now there was famine in the land. Besides the, besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. Do you guys remember Abra the, the famine when Abraham had a famine? Where did Abraham go when there was a famine? Egypt, okay. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Remember, God seems to not want Isaac to leave the promised land. And he knew that Abraham... Uh, when there was a famine, went down to Egypt. What did Abraham do when he was down in Egypt? Lied about his wife, right? He said, she's my sister, because he didn't want anybody to, to hurt him and to take her. Kind of crazy story. I mean, who in the world would do something like that? Let's keep reading. Okay, so the, the Lord appeared to Isaac. Don't go down to Egypt and live in the land where I tell you. Stay in the land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For you and your descendants, I will give all the lands and will confirm the oath I swear 
I swore to your father Abraham, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them to all the, these lands. And through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Now, uh, we alluded to this verse last week when the question was asked uh, about all the sin in the land and the punishment that God gave to people. How did people know? Because God hadn't given the law yet, but obviously God was speaking to people because he says that Abraham obeyed my commandments. So God had given commandments. Uh, we don't know how, when, and where he gave them or how, but we know that God gave commandments because Abraham is blessed for obeying the commandments. So there was law, if you will, before God gave the law. We on the same page? Okay. So God wants Isaac to stay in the land, and he says, you stay in the land, and I'm going to, and he, he repeats this thing, your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky, I'm going to give you this land, I'm going to give you everything that I told uh, your father that I was going to give you, so stay in the land. Now, why in the world is he supposed to stay in the land? Have we figured out why he can't leave? Because you would think he could leave and come back, but why is God saying, stay here? Any ideas? I'll repeat it. So you think it's the same thing again, same reason, that he'd be tempted to stay somewhere. Yeah, so just like in the previous chapter when he said, go and find a, a wife and bring back. And we, we had said probably because we didn't want him to go and find a place and, and stay and settle there and move out of the promise of God. Same thing. If he goes down to Egypt, maybe he finds fertile land down in Egypt and things are going good. And he's like, hey, I, this is nice here. I might just stay here. So God's like, nope, stay in the place that I'm going to send you or that I'm going to give you. Don't, don't take it all. Uh, don't go somewhere else and find another place because this is going to be my place for you. It says, when the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she's my sister. I thought we read this story before. He's going to do the same thing that his dad did. They're like, who is this woman? She looks good. He's like, oh, she's my sister. You know, I don't believe in generational curses, but I do believe that we do things dumb from one generation to the next because we learn from, from uh, the people that are around us. And while Abraham was a godly man and a man of faith, and he's looked at, I mean, in the New Testament, I think Abraham's name, I think, is, is listed 60 times. The only other Old Testament uh, name that's used more than Abraham in the New Testament is Moses, I believe. And Abraham was a man of faith. He's a, he's a picture of what we are supposed to be in faith, but he still did dumb things. And praise God that we mess up too, but we can still be people of faith, right? And so uh, Abraham makes this mistake, and Isaac goes on and does the same thing. Um, he says, she's my sister, because he was afraid to say she's my wife. He thought the men of that place might kill me on account of Rebekah, because she is Beautiful. Rebecca and Sarah must have been good-looking ladies. I mean, serious. To think my wife is so beautiful that I got to tell people she's my sister because she's so good-looking that somebody might kill me to try to get her. I mean, they must have been, like, really good-looking. And they were old. Sarah was, like, 60. 60's not old. You can't say that. 60's not old. When they went into Egypt? I think she was 60 or 70 when they went to Egypt. I'd have to do the backwards math. You can do the math while I'm talking. Or you can, never mind, that's all right. But either way, she was older and still good looking. We, how old is Rebecca here? Um, she's over, she's probably... She's at least 60, because Isaac was 60 when she gave birth. 
We're assuming he was 40 when he got married. She could have been quite a bit younger. Either way, she's not a spring spring chicken, but she's a chicken. Okay. Whatever. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's late. It's past my bedtime. Okay. 7.30. It is, okay, I'm kind of joking. Okay. Um, where are we at? Oh, he said uh, she's, she's my sister because he was afraid uh, to say that she's my wife. He thought the, man, the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. Now, why would you be touching your sister like that? That's what he was thinking, right? So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my life on account for her. Then Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Wow, this is such a similar story from Abraham and Sarah. And a godly man is rebuked by someone that isn't following God for their immoral character. That's a tough place to be sometimes. I don't know if you've ever been there where you as a believer are supposed to be somebody with high moral moral character and somebody that's not a believer rebukes you for you doing something wrong. That will really put you in your place. And we see this happens here. And so he says, nobody, nobody touch this guy. No harm will be on you. So very, very similar story. Uh, and uh, this is kind of crazy. So I, I want to let you guys know. So Abimelech is not necessarily the guy's name, but it's more of a title of, of the leader in that area. Because right now, he's still in the promised land, but it, he hasn't taken possession of it yet. Just like Abraham, while he was in the land that God promised him, he never owned a piece of property other than the cave and the field that he had purchased from the, uh, from the people for burial for Sarah. It's still, Isaac still has other people in the land there. It's not quite given to him. Does this make sense? It's not going to be for a while yet. Um, It says, Isaac planted crops in that land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filled them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar where he settled. This is very similar to Abraham too. When did Abraham get all of his wealth? Not all of his wealth, but when did he become very wealthy? When he went down to Egypt, when he moved because of the famine. Now, Isaac doesn't go to Egypt, but he goes to another area and becomes wealthy there because of the famine. And then they say, you know what, you've become too wealthy. They get jealous of him. And what do they do because they're jealous of him? They stop up the wells because wells are important, right? If you have a lot of livestock, if you have, like, you need water. In the Middle East, you need water, right? And so they stop up all the wells, and, and, and Abimelech says, get out of here. We want you to leave. You've become too wealthy. Um, you've become too powerful. You've got to get out of here. And so um, they, they stop up the wells. And what a shame that they stop up the wells. Because wells are precious. They're hard to dig. They're hard to come by. Like, this is a big deal. And so Isaac, it says, so, um, so the move away from us. You've become too powerful. So he moves away. And they encamp outside of where they were, not too far away, but enough far away where the people are, okay, he's at a distance now. He's at an arm's length. We'll be okay. He's out of of our hair. It says, Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father gave them. 
smart. He reopens the wells that his father had dug years previously. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. Notice it says they discovered a well of fresh water there. This is not one of the old wells. This is a new well. So this is better than a regular well because a freshwater well means it's like flowing water instead of stagnant water. So if you find a flowing water, it's a lot better. Right? Right, Steve? Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, the water is ours. So he named that well Essek. Does anybody know what that means? Essek, he named the well. We said names are important. What? Dispute, yeah. Dispute or contention, because uh, what? They contended over the well. They disputed over the well, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Sitna. What's that mean? Yep, enmity, hostility, hatred. Right? These are, these are wells that are being fought over. He moved from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth. What's Rehoboth mean? Plenty of room, wide open spaces, roominess. It's also where Joe Biden has a beach house, if you don't follow politics, in Delaware. Um, saying, now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. I, I love this story. I actually preached on this story about like a year and a half ago, I think. Um, I love the story because Jacob is a well digger, right? Always digging wells, trying to find these wells. And, and there, I, there's a cool principle in here, and, and I want to share it with you guys. And I brought this up uh, a little while ago, a year, about a year and a half ago. In our lives, a lot of times, we see that he's going through this, he's, he's, he's get kicked kicked out of where he was, so the first thing he does because he needs to be able to sustain himself is he opens up old wells that his father dug. And I think a lot of times in our lives, we have to open up old wells. We have to kind of go back to the things that worked in the past, the things that we know, right, the, the people that came before us. We can lean on what they've done. Does this make sense? But eventually, to be sustained fully, he had to go and dig his own wells, he had to find new water and fresh water. And I think in our lives a lot of times we have the, we, sometimes we, I don't want to say we get lazy, but sometimes we just kind of rest in what happened in the past and we settle in what's always been. We settle in what was there before us. We settle in what's easier because we're just redigging what somebody else already did the hard work for. But to be sustained and to have really what you need, sometimes you need to go and do the hard work and really dig some new wells and find some fresh water and do some new things. It doesn't mean that the old wells are bad. It just means sometimes we need something fresh and something new that we had to dig that we had to work for that we had to get. Does that make sense? We only got nine verses left. And everybody said, okay. Any questions on that? So we'll open it up for a little bit here. Do we have a mic runner? Are you running mics? All right. I'll, oh, I'll get over here. You get over there. You get back there. There's a business uh, model that says that uh, the hardworking father that establishes a business, the son takes it over, and not so much. But by the third generation, they typically fail, you know, because, and again, that's not in every case, but it's, it's talked about. You know, I've actually heard that and read that, and I've read that the second generation often even does better than the first generation, but then the third generation that never saw the first generation's hard work, sweat, and sacrifice to get it going, that's kind of when they rest on their, and, and it kind of goes downhill. Well, that's interesting. Because the generation just, yeah. 
You got a mic back there? Oh, he's already got it. And uh, probably next week we're going to be talking about it a little bit more. And I was wondering about the wells. When he, of course, we, we do look at the wells as prosperity and also sustaining. And also, like you said, it is good sometimes to go back to those wells and dig them back up. It's also important to remember, like you said, that those people who have gone before us have established things. And we're going to tie that to the church itself and even this church that there are people that have gone before us who have established things, who have made this building what we're living, living in and prospering in. And we can't remember that. But the important thing is, it is our duty to find the freshness. It is our duty to find that well that is living, as it was referred to, a living well. That's our responsibility because then that living well is going to be the next well for the next generation. Our job is to pass that on to our, the next generation. I'm going to give an illustration of that. The, in the past, I went to a church and I was uh, one of the youth leaders. And one of the things we did was we would take about every three years or every four years, take the entire youth group, and sometimes it consisted of 100-plus kids, and we would take them and hike them up on the hill. There was about 100 acres that were owned. And we sat down and we let them look over that land, that property, and say, this is an inheritance to you. Someone else paid for it. Someone else sustained it. But it's going to be your duty to move it forward. No matter if you're going to hear, be here for another generation or not, it's your duty right now. What are you going to do with it? And... It's our duty right now. What are we going to do with it? And to remember to pass that on. We have a lot to do, but we have been given a lot to do it with. And we just want to encourage that to, uh, to look to the future because we have still yet many more living wells to accomplish and to attack. And that is an awesome thing. We got great footage here, footing, and why not use it and be encouraged and say, it sure is better than starting to dig a foundation. <laughs> yeah, and that, and I think that's kind of what um, what Ed was saying. Sometimes, like generations are removed from the, you know, the original hard work, the the blood, sweat, and tears that came into it, and then they don't sustain it because they don't recognize what it took to get there. And so, yeah, when you're talking about family culture, when you're talking about church culture, business culture, always remember who brought you to the place that you're at because that's important you know we 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 don't start from scratch we start on the shoulders of men and women that came before us and we can't forget that the the principle that I like here is that going back to the old wells helped them survive but they couldn't thrive on the old wells they had to have new and fresh water to continue to move forward which that's why I just love I love that story because it's 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 a great illustration a couple more verses um, from there he went to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Lord. I'm sorry, he didn't say that. He said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So why is he going to increase his descendants? Because of his father, because of who came before him and his faithfulness and his, you know, his keeping of the commandments and his walking close with God. It says, Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar and with um, Ahuzeth, his personal advisor, um, and another guy who's the commander of his forces, Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, We saw clearly that the Lord was with you. 
So he said, there ought to be, let's just stop there. How did they see clearly that the Lord was with them? They prospered. Like, okay, this guy's obviously blessed. We've heard about his dad. We've heard about him. We know that God said that he's going to bless them. And we see that this guy is just blessed. He's got wealth. He's digging wells. We tried to kick him out to get him out of our hair. And it doesn't matter where we send him. He seems to prosper. Obviously, God is with him. That's probably why. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Think about it. Yeah, that's a great point that we that we kind of like brushed over. Like when they said, "Hey, get out of here. We 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 stopped up your wells. We want you to leave." Like if it was me, I would have been like, "I ain't leaving. I'm digging those suckers back up and you guys, let's let's fight." But he's like, "Sure, I'll go." Kind of reminds me of when Abraham and Lot not that they were at odds, but their people were at odds. And Abraham's like, hey, you pick where you want to go, and I'll just go the other way. All these similarities between father and son, good and bad. That's a great point. I, I don't want to reread. 12, 13, Isaac planted crops in the land. Yeah, and he reaped a hundredfold because he was blessed by the Lord. Yep. But they wanted to kick him out because of that. And now they say, well, I guess you're blessed because you're still sustaining that. Yeah. So Isaac builds an altar there, pitches a tent there. His servants dig this well. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. They answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said there ought to be a sworn agreement between us. I love this. They're like, obviously you're blessed by the Lord. Obviously the Lord is with you. We do not want to be your enemy. Like, we don't want to fight against you because we realize God's on your side. And so, um, so that you will do us no harm, just as we did not harm you, but always treated you well and sent you away peacefully. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Hmm. Half truth, maybe, right? They did stop up as well and tell him to get out of there. But at least they didn't kill him. I guess that's what they're saying. So we were nice to you. We didn't kill you. So um, Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. Early the next morning, the man swore on uh, an oath to each. The men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug. They said, we have found water. He called it Sheba. Anybody know what that means? Oath, yeah. And to this day, or, se yeah, did somebody say seven? Yeah. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. So we see um, they dig another well. God just continues to bless them, and, and they go away peacefully, and they're going to live at peace here for a while. And then there's this little tag on two verses at the very end of chapter uh, 26. It says, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beri the Hittite, and also... Basemeth, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, these weren't just bad girls. What did he do that was wrong here that we've seen? If you've been studying through Genesis with us, what in the world does Esau do here that is probably going to bring a lot of grief to his parents? Married foreign women. Remember God time and time again said, don't marry a, a woman that's not part of the faith. Don't wear, marry a woman that serves pagan gods. Don't marry a woman outside of what we believe. because we, And we see it all the way in the time of Nehemiah. These are issues. Like This becomes issue for many, 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 many years where paganism is brought in through marriage, whether it's a, a Jewish girl marrying a pagan man or vice versa. But we see Esau, I think Esau's like, screw you, mom and dad, I'm going to get my ears pierced. <laughs> no. uh, or a tattoo. Nobody thinks that's... 
My dad was mad at me when I got my first tattoo. Okay, so um, anyway, he's like, hey, I'm going to marry these girls that I like, whether you guys want it or not, and they knew better than that. And so we see that he becomes a source of grief uh, for Isaac and Rebecca. And so um, we're going to see, I mean, later on in Scripture, it's going to talk about Esau and how he was not a great dude, okay? And it all kind of starts, didn't all start here, but we see that he disappoints his mom and dad, and it becomes an issue for them. And so we have Isaac now who's got wealth and doing all these great things. And we got Esau who's going out and marrying girls that his mom and dad don't want him to. So we see two totally different things with these brothers. That's it for 25 and 26. Kind of crazy. I know not a lot of deep theological discussion tonight. Some chapters are good for that. Some aren't. Um, we got a couple minutes left. Are there any questions or comments? Steve's got a question. Go figure. <laughs> You got to turn it on. <laughs> oh. I never really saw this before, but Isaac really handled himself well in this situation. I mean, they were stopping up wells, which was, you know, like you said, in, in the Middle East and dry country, that was pretty heavy-handed. I'm assuming they could just redig them, but they wanted him out of there, and he basically just left, and he kept on, you know, trying to find new wells. He met a lot of resistance, but he kept persevering, and then he did find water, and, and then these goons come, and, oh, we want to make a peace treaty with you, and, you know, he goes through the formalities of having the peace. He could have said, yeah, things are cool, now just get out of here, you know, yeah. but he didn't. I mean, he really kept his cool, and you've got to respect him for that. Absolutely. I've not given him a mic. No. I'm not allowed to have this. We're looking at today in today's what's going on over in Israel today with Hamas, who I've talked to a lot of friends in the, in the intelligence community. They, Hamas wants to destroy Israel totally and wipe them off the earth. They, they don't want nothing to do with them, but yet they kind of they broke bread here, but that's not happening today. I mean, I guess, how do we relate, the two relate? Well, so it's interesting that you bring that up because remember Ishmael's offspring, where they settle, is going to, is, we're actually going to see most of the Arab people of today are coming from that side of the family. And um, it says back in chapter 25, it says that they lived, I think it says in contention with them or at, with hostility towards them. And so that's actually the people groups that you're talking about. So less here. I understand the principle here. Um, but Ishmael's sons are going to be the Arab nations now that are coming against um, Isaac's offspring, Jacob, you know, when we get there. Um, and so we actually, there's that contention starting right here. And we read it at the end of 25 where they lived in hostility towards each other. And today they're still living in hostility towards each other, which is crazy um, because it's, it all, the roots are right back to here. So, yeah, it's interesting that you see it today as you would see back then. Um, I w back to Gerar, which is a little south of Gaza. Um, I, I, I thought it was interesting that it wasn't really, and you kind of hit on that, that it wasn't really the land. It was the land that was supposed to be Isaac's anyway, but it wasn't at that time. So it wasn't like God said, he said, don't go to Egypt, but he didn't have a problem with him just being there. Because it was still part of the land. Yeah, it was nor way north of Egypt. Yeah, but it's just amazing how Gaza has been there all through history. The Philistines had it, and the, it's just really interesting. Yeah. It's cra and you see it, I mean, when we studied the book of Judges, same people groups fighting each other then. I mean, it just keeps moving forward and until Jesus comes and sets all things right and sets up his rule and reign 
here, it's it's going to continue to be a an area of the world that's contested, and it starts with Ishmael. Hi, the wells, the fresh water, to me says fresh revelation, and I think part of the, our generation only God can give us revelation. I mean, you can tell your children this is your inheritance, this is what you. But they have to have a revelation of God themselves or the next generation has to have a revelation of God themselves in order to understand the covenant and the inheritance. So only the Holy, that's the work of the Holy Spirit and I think we miss that sometimes in not um, praying for the revelation to the next generation because we can say it all we want. We can say to your kids, you own this or that's your land or, you know, we give you this. But until they understand why and how and what the plan of God is in their life. So I think we need to pray for revelation to these generations because only the Holy Spirit can do that. Yeah, it's, it's repeat. It's, that's great. Uh, you know, book of Judges because it's fresh on my mind. Uh, you know, the, a judge dies and it says, and again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then that judge is raised up and, they did, and again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Like one generation to the next, they always forget what the next generation was doing. Even if they hand it off to them, they need to have a realization and a reality in their life of it. They can't live off of the last generation. And that's the same with all of us here. We can't live on the stories of our parents and grandparents and their encounters with God and the miracles that they've seen and the, the testimonies that they have. We, we, lo- we can stand on those and see God's faithfulness in those, but we need to experience those for ourselves. We, we're not just looking back at history. We're looking forward to something fresh, like you said. Got co- two more questions or que- comments. Yeah, I um, just wanted to state that there are wells overflowing on Frankston Road. And I, being a member here since the last membership class of Pastor Leek, I want to encourage everyone here to come over and help, help guide people to those wells. And I just thought it was worth mentioning. Okay, Tony. When did you sneak in? Uh (laughs) So I I agree totally that we have to, um, you know, pray for a fresh revelation for the next generation. But we also need to continually pray for fresh revelation for this generation because there was something that happened that caused the Israelites through the centuries to not recognize that they needed to do something to make sure that it stayed fresh with the next generation. And a lot of times what we do as Christians is we think that we're mature. We think that we know when in fact, sometimes the Lord wants to do something a little bit different, even with us, that we would know how to translate the gospel to the next generation, or we would know how to, you know, pass it on, and that we are not stuck in our, you know, just like the manna. Manna wasn't supposed to be for the next day, right? And we, but we're still sucking on yesterday's manna instead of, you know, getting the fresh stuff. Yep, that's good. Yeah, we have none of us have arrived, whether we're 41 or 91, <laughs> or anywhere in between or below or b- above that. Um, that's good. Yeah, we we need that freshness. Um, cool. I'm gonna close this out, and I think that's how I'll pray for us tonight. Before I pray, um, I want to remind you guys. I just put a a post out on social media. I want to remind you guys we are doing a nine o'clock service over at in Penn Hills at the fold that Jeff just alluded to. Uh, Love for you guys to be a part of that. Um, Nine o'clock service. You're going to get the same service basically that you get here. It's just at nine o'clock. So if you're an early riser, come on over there at nine o'clock. We'd love to have you over there. If you go to church there, it's the same as coming to church here. 
two, uh, two locations but one church. Um, also, this weekend, I just want to make an announcement. Um, we have a bunch of outreach opportunities this weekend for you. I, is that up there? Did he already turn that off, that rascal? Um, we have a bunch of outreach opportunities this weekend. On Friday at 11 o'clock, there's a food bank over at the Fold. Friday at 6 o'clock, there's a food bank over at the Fold. And on Saturday, there's outreach from 1 to 3 over at the Fold. So you might say, well, I don't know. Oh, Sunday, that's not at the Fold, though. I'm going to talk about that Sunday morning, so don't worry about that. But anyway, if you guys want to do any outreach, we got three different opportunities for you. If you just show up and say, put me to work, we'll put you to work. There it is. Let's pray. <laughs> Six o'clock, men's at the Fold on Friday night as well. Yeah, I wasn't going to go through all the announcements, but sure, 6 o'clock. So you can serve in the food bank and then go into the men's thing. That sounds like a good idea. All right, God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for uh, all these things that you show us um, throughout Scripture, God, in the time of Abraham and Isaac and as we get into Jacob. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for the stories, God, for your faithfulness, that we can look back and see uh, that you've been faithful for generations and generations, and your promises stay true. God, we uh, were reminded tonight as we looked at the story about the wells that were dug, the fresh wells, and the wells that were reopened from, from uh, the Father. Uh, God, so we just pray right now that we as a people would, would see that and we would realize, God, that we can reopen the old wells and see the great things that those that have come before us have done. And God, they, those will sustain us for a time, but God, we pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh vision, fresh wells, fresh water for our generation and for the generation that comes after us, God, that we wouldn't just rest on the successes that we might have had or the successes of the past, but we would look forward to continue to see your move and what you're going to do in this church and in our lives and in our families and in our businesses. God, we, uh, we believe that you're bringing fresh anointing and fresh water and fresh wells in our lives all the time. So help us to, to be able to see those and, and to, to be able to open those up and see you work. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done and, and we love you. We thank you so much for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys for being here tonight. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here.